How are y'all? Luckily, mine is just as funny as that. Because all my shit is funny. So this is an abbreviated uh, short story in tandem. Um, uh, so I guess what you need to know is that the other story, it's a little sibling story, is about a dude who's lovesick um, and um, his next door neighbor's little kid, um, he brings him over to watch Star Trek because there's a storm that's come in. And so um, they watch Star Trek together and he's making the night good for the kid. And in the morning, the kid's mother is found um, beaten and drowned outside. Just as funny. <laughs> this one's called The Fragrance of Our Days. This was before Sada met up with Manny, after her late day shift at the Waikoloa Suites, and had four shots of fireball because she could feel herself turning again, because a storm blew in, and in that storm were fissures of the past. And before Manny's crazy ex Carly approached her in the parking lot, pulled her long black hair back into a ponytail, and gave Sada a right hook. And so Sada hooked her back, then watched her fall to the ground and started kicking and kicking and stomping until Manny was out in the parking lot yelling and pushing her away. And before she saw spots, not stars, just thousands of tiny white spots, like the snow she imagined fell in places she'd never been. So she ran, right past her car onto Pahoa Village Road and kept running the whole five miles to get to her son through burning winds, through pelting rain because he'd make the thousands of spots disappear. When she was 10, the Abakan family watched green sea turtles sun the black sands of Pumalubu Beach. Sada and her two younger brothers rode skimboards in the surf, and Mr. and Mrs. Abakan watched on in wide-brimmed coconut hats, eating banana fritters, remarking at the bliss of a family, their own parents now gone. They hadn't known that the day before, an earthquake hit South America, and that continental shift created a tsunami that traveled through the night. Had the sirens been working, they would have heeded the warning. Had they been paying attention, they would have noticed the Ulili and Duwagu take to the sky, and the exodus of turtle into the ocean. But when the waters pulled back, the children cooed and giggled, and Mr. and Mrs. Avakan hurried to the shore. For a moment, the five stood in the hush of the oncoming wave, its 20 feet hidden in the horizon. When they turned to run, Mr. Abakan grabbed one boy and Mrs. Abakan the other, and saw the can't know why and has never wanted to know why, just stopped short and watched her family continue up past the picnic table toward the car. And when the wave hit, there was an instinct in her to cling to the trunk of a palm, nails dug in, teeth buried into the bark, eyes closed tightly, and that is where she stayed until hours later, rescue workers pet the back of her hands and her head until she opened her eyes and released. After Sada lived in the children's ward at West Hawaii Health Center, where the nurses and doctors would call her a miracle, would shake their heads at any possibility that a person, let alone a little girl, could survive such an event. For one year, she didn't speak. And then one cloudy day, the humidity locked in the heat, and she said, that smells like my mom pointing at the plumeria tree outside the psychiatrist's office through the open window, the smell of the very sweetest peach. That next year, she rattled on about her brothers and the turtles and her parents and the train of waves that battered her in the tree over and over until there was nothing. At 12, she was moved into a county facility for orphaned girls where she painted and drew small pencil books about imaginary vacations her family took. Those imaginings allowed her to heal enough that at 14, she entered a foster home with the Tudelas, a Spanish, Spanish Filipinos with two young sons. And it was as if her family hadn't died, that they had made it to the car and sped away just in time, transformed by the wind and waves into different looking people. For a good while, she felt comfortable and ate at the dining table and talked about her eighth grade teacher and let the brothers tease her and laugh when they did. But it's hard to erase a loss. Harder still to reconcile a fervor. Don't you want to get better? The psychiatrist would ask, and she would explain that there was always something at the edges of her trying to get in, like she was never meant to escape that water, like the world could all fall away. The psychiatrist would say, you have to face your fear, and since she did want to get better, one Sunday Sada joined the Tudelas to Hupuna Beach, the first time she'd come near the ocean in four years. 
The sun was high and hot and reflected off the white sand that stretched for a half mile. The Judellas gathered at a barbecue and grilled pork belly. Sada laughed at the boys chasing each other with long strands of seaweed. She managed to look out of the water, if only for a moment, and she took a deep breath, smiled, and felt mostly fine until she walked to the bathroom, sheltered by a grove of plumeria trees. And as the sweet smell of her mother once brought her out of silence, this time it created a sickness. And after, she smoked menthols and drank vodka from the pint bottle and stole her foster mom's car and let all three Vasquez brothers do her in an outrigger canoe at the HB Rowing Club, one after the other, each coming inside her, which left her pregnant at 16 with her boy, Amato. And he calmed the sickness for a good long while. But now, Manny and his Impala paces at her side, reaches across the seat, rolls down the window and yells, get in. Sada doesn't look, doesn't answer. Rather, she lengthens her strides so that if you saw her from your kitchen window, you'd think she was floating. And then Manny's gone, and the light is gone, and she is alone, and the road seems like the road between where she had been and where she could be, and she smiles into the joy of that potential. Sada stops short of home, balls and unballs her fists, calms her breathing, then opens the door to her duplex. And she looks for a model who should be there on the daybed, in his baseball cap, the blanket pulled tight under his chin. But he's not there, and the spots are back, so she looks into the closet and nothing, and she can feel the sickness. And though it doesn't make sense, she flips up the bed and the coffee table, pitches the nightstand, and tears down the curtains. She opens the sliding glass door to the patio, and there is the ocean usually 10 feet out, past the rock wall. Now, the waves are pushing up and over. And why is she by the sea? Because her little boy said it's what made him feel calm and good. And that became her chance to face the dread, to come to terms. A break catches her ankles and knocks her to the lava rock. She feels the sting of salt and the cuts across her forehead and legs. And when she pulls herself standing, she sees the light from Gary's duplex and hurries to the glass door. And there is her boy, asleep on Gary's couch, in his baseball cap, a blanket tucked tight under his chin. And when she looks real close, she sees a faint, sleepy smile. And that seems like a reckoning. The white spots fade, but do not fall. And the stars are far away, so very far away. And she doesn't know if the ocean raises up its arms and pulls her in, or if she lays down and resigns herself to the black. And really, she thinks, it doesn't matter. Oh, wow.